What happens when there's a fire? You call the fire department and they put it out. It works so well that if it wasn't there, you would invent it. It seems so simple and obvious. But in actual fact, it's not really that simple. Putting out fires works because we've learned effective firefighting techniques. We have fire departments full of trained professionals that work effectively in teams using proven methods and well-designed equipment. Their work is also supported by public education on fire safety. In short, they are well-trained, well-organized, well-understood, well-equipped and well-resourced. Wouldn't it be nice if the same were true for protecting children from harm in emergencies? In conflicts and disasters around the world, three major things happen to children. One, the problems many of them already have, like access to basic services, get even worse. Two, new problems emerge, like new forms of violence and exploitation. Three, children's existing support systems start to get overstretched or fall apart, and they end up much more vulnerable than before. They may lose their parents, and even if they don't, their families are likely to be overwhelmed by events and the challenges of how to cope. Despite its obligations to do so, the government may not be able to respond to the situation and provide children with the protection they need. So, extra support is needed. A special kind of worker dedicated to protecting children and keeping them safe from harm. And here's a child protection worker trying to do just that. Just like a firefighter, she's probably from the local community. But, like a firefighter, she shouldn't be out there alone, under pressure to work out all the solutions she needs as she goes. So, what does our child protection worker need to make her work doable and efficient? First, she needs to have the most up-to-date knowledge on how to keep children safe from physical danger and injury, and how to support them when they've been separated from their caregivers. She also needs to know how to protect children from different forms of violence, from recruitment into armed groups, from psychosocial distress and child labor. Of course, she also needs to know how best to respond when these things have already happened to children, how to restore their well-being and how to keep them safe from further harm. So how will our child protection worker get all this knowledge? It makes most sense to gather existing knowledge from the experience of child protection responders all over the world and from other relevant sources of wisdom and learning. Then we can put it all into one neat package. Ah, here we have it, the child protection minimum standards. We can also conduct new research by evaluating familiar programs and testing out new ones to build a bank of best practices for our child protection worker to draw from. We can also help her by providing tried and tested assessment tools to determine where the needs, capacities and gaps are so that she can plan the appropriate response. Then we need to provide her with some programmatic tools to help her deliver child protection services, such as guidance on family reunification, reducing child labor, tackling violence and ensuring smooth case management for every child. Now, our child protection worker has all the necessary knowledge and tools, but she can't meet all the needs on her own. She needs some teammates who are well-trained, who speak the same technical language and are available to support the response alongside her. These workers will likely come from different organizations and backgrounds and will need to work together well within the broader humanitarian effort. So we'll need to appoint or deploy coordinators to ensure everyone is working together as efficiently as possible from a common plan. Of course, we also need the funds to make all of this possible. Our child protection worker may be smart, but she can't make money out of thin air. So, how much money does it take to protect children in emergencies? Well, to figure this out, we'll need some tools to track the nature and scale of the risks facing boys and girls, so we can determine what resources we need to protect them. Now, we have our provisional budget. But hmm, where's the money? Good question. Believe it or not, child protection isn't always seen as an urgent priority. That's probably because there are other important things taking up room on the agenda. Of course, these things also help to protect children. So we need to persuade humanitarians and governments to keep doing them, but also deliver on their responsibilities to keep children protected from harm, even in emergencies. We also need communication tools that provide clear explanations and demonstrate results to help the people in charge of funding make the best decisions for children and communities everywhere. Well, our child protection worker has been on a long journey. And look how well prepared she is now. 
She has the knowledge, skills and the tools she needs to do her job well. She also has the necessary funding and ideally the support and commitment of government behind her, linking her to the broader child protection system in country. And as she works hard to keep children safe from all kinds of harm, she's got strong support to lean on. So just like fighting fires, it's really not that simple. If we want to protect children, we need to be well-trained, well-organized, well-understood, well-equipped and well-resourced. It takes all these things to protect children. But at the end of the day, it's worth it, don't you think?